Okay, what we're gonna do then is we're gonna get into the last of our trickster hero characters for the day. This is one of the most famous tricksters. Um, partly because of the, I mean, it's always been a kind of a famous character in mythology because Norse mythology, if there's any body of mythology that is fairly well known in the West, next to the Greek material, it's gonna be the Norse material. So you probably already heard of Loki at some point, but I was about to say he's more famous today than ever before, thanks to Marvel, right? I mean, Loki has been one of the in most interesting characters, I think, that actually has made an appearance in the Marvel Universe. Uh, <clears throat> and of course, those movies are new. The character's been around in the comic books since the 60s, but um, you know, not everybody followed the comic books, but the movies have you know, increased the popularity way beyond the comic book realm, so... What we're going to cover today is called The Death of Balder, and this is a story that your textbook primarily draws from the, the, um, the prose edda. Now, I don't remember if I've introduced you guys to any of that material yet, so I think in the PowerPoint we're going to do a little bit of a background for the Norse material, and we're going to be dealing with more Norse material as the course goes on. Uh, I know that one of your assignments was actually to watch the Marvel movie Thor, so we'll have a discussion about that film down the road, but we're also going to be dealing with one of the greatest sagas in the Norse world, the Volsunga saga, and we're going to spend um, an entire lecture on that story, and if you haven't read that story, please, please read the one, uh, the version of it that's in your textbook. It's not purely the, the Volsunga saga, it's got some other stuff mixed in, but um, That'll be fun discussion. It's one of my favorite stories. But in today's story, you're going to get introduced to a lot of the characters that are going to make their appearance there. So in a mythology class, generally you want to cover the pantheon before you get to the heroes, since we're focusing mainly on the heroes. The pantheon is going to be introduced in a brief format in this story, okay? Because Baldur is a god. He's not a trickster character, but the character of Loki definitely is. Now, since this is the last class we're focusing on trickster heroes, I probably should mention that we, we barely scratch the surface when it comes to tricksters. You've got tricksters from all over the world, you know, Native American culture, coyote. Uh, there's a number of different characters um, that fall into the category. Tezcatlipoca among the Aztecs. You got Maui in the Polynesian tradition. Uh, we're not touching any of those. And part of that, I feel like I, I should apologize, but we need to get on to the other stuff, so I'm going to definitely have to include Loki. And as we go through the story, hopefully as you read the story, you're already thinking about parallels between Loki and maybe Prometheus, maybe some of the characters we've seen even earlier, like Satan or the serpent in the garden. Um, by the end of the presentation, hopefully you're going to have more of an idea of how they're similar, how they're different. I think I may have said that at the end of the last lecture. So what we're going to do is we're going to just dive in, take a look at Loki, as the trickster hero and the story, the death of Balder. Now, there are lots of stories that deal with Loki, but this is probably the most famous of them. And it's really the story where he is the most notorious. I mean, when you think of Loki, he tends to be interpreted as, a, as not just a trickster hero, but kind of a god of evil. It's better to call him a god of mischief, which is kind of what the tricksters are in general, right? They're these chaotic figures that challenge the order, that push the boundaries and, you know, kind of break the rules. And in this story, really, I say he's most notorious because he really comes across as a very malicious figure, which he is not always in Norse mythology. Um, sometimes he is a fairly helpful Individual. As a matter of fact, when we read the Volsunga saga later, he really doesn't come across as a villain at all. But in this story, it's clear that he's the bad guy. Um, there's a couple different visuals of him right there. Of course, the Marvel version pulled from the comic books, uh, very similar to the way they depict him in the movies. And then um, an older manuscript which depicts him um, in a very different way. Um, again, kind of creepy looking individual, even in that context. So let's take a look at the background, okay, the Norse people, where are they from? We're talking Germanic peoples, and there are lots of different tribes that would fall under that umbrella of Germanic people, speaking Germanic languages, uh, related group of languages. And you first see them kind of show up in history around 500 BC. We start to see kind of a, a movement of Germanic tribes in Northern Euro Europe, 
that filtered down into Europe. And it's a mixture of people. On the map that I've given you there, obviously I'm highlighting the Scandinavian territories, Norway, Sweden, Denmark, but Germanic uh, tribes, of course, were much further south. I mean, maybe not much further south. You could actually see Germany, Poland, and uh, that region right below. And then, of course, off to the side, you've got the island of Britain, marked UK on the map, and you're going to have, you know, Norse or Viking settlements uh, throughout these regions. So, but before we get there, because this is obviously way before the Viking era, 500 BC, you're going to start to see kind of a migration into central and southern areas of Germany by the second, first century BC. As a matter of fact, we get our earliest references to these people coming from the, uh, the Greek and Roman writers. And the Romans themselves had a lot of interaction with the Germans, uh, starting back during the Roman Republic. And Rome was very concerned to kind of stop kind of the, the movement of these tribes into Roman territory. Of course, Roman territory is always expanding, so uh, the Romans were uh, kind of guilty of moving into German territory at the same time. But that's where they first get, you know, introduced to the written history. And there are three basic groupings if you're going to simplify things, and this is definitely a simplification. You get the groups that are form, form basically the e eastern portion of the Germanic peoples, which are ultimately going to filter into the region that we'll call Poland. You get the western tribes that come into what is now Germany, and then you've got the northern people up in Scandinavia. As far as the first group or waves of migration, um, starting in the first century and on AD, really up through the, the 600s, you've got migrations that ultimately caused the fragmentation of the Roman Empire. So if you're familiar at all with Roman history, most people have heard of the, the fall of Rome, usually dated at 476. Uh, this is the fall of Western Rome, if you could even call it a fall. It's more of a fragmentation into a number of territories that end up being occupied by these German groups. So some of the groups I've got listed here, and some of them are actually going to be relevant to some of the Norse mythology later, but um, Angles and Saxons and Jutes are usually the ones that um, people think of when they think of Britain, right? So prior to their arrival, uh, Britain was occupied by British tribes, um, the Celts. And I don't think we're going to get a chance to do Celtic mythology this semester, though I may mention it every once in a while. Uh, the Celts were there prior to the arrival of the Angles and the Saxons. And when you think of Anglo-Saxon um, England, as a matter of fact, the word England comes from the, the word Angle, right? It's the land of the Angles. And that's because of these tribes that migrate in during this time period, particularly in the um, 5th century and on. And that's actually going to be the, the, the root of the whole Arthurian tradition. So when we get to King Arthur later, we're going to talk a little bit more about the Saxons and the Celts and their interaction in Britain. <clears throat> in what the Romans called Gaul, also a Celtic territory, you have the arrival of the Franks, the Burgundians. They're going to form the background for the Volsunga saga. Then you've got Goths, you know, various groups of Goths, Othrogoths, uh, Visigoths moving into Italy, Spain, Vandals uh, moving into Spain and North Africa, okay? And then Rome basically ceases to be a political unit, and you have all these separate um, territories or kingdoms that uh, arise. <clears throat> Things kind of settle down briefly, and then by the time we get to the 8th century, late 8th century, you're going to see another wave of Germanic movement. You can talk about it as a migration, sometimes it's an exploration, but these are going to be the northern tribes that we're going to call the Norse or the Vikings, um, in the east, they're generally referred to as the Varangians. But these are going to be pillaging expeditions, eventually settlements that are going to stretch from the far east in Mesopotamia to the far west in North America. Okay, pretty much from the period that I have there, from the 8th century up through the 11th century. They found a colony in Iceland. Iceland is going to become one of the most important um, centers of Nordic culture in that it remains more purely Norse in that it keeps alive the Norse traditions a little bit longer than the territories in Europe, probably because of the influence of Christianity on the Norse. You have a, a period of conversion to Christianity over the centuries so that by the year around 1000, most of the Norse had been Christianized. Iceland eventually is Christianized as well, but you do have more of the uh, pagan tradition live on there a little bit longer. 
Um, and then Normandy is kind of where we're wrapping things up as far as the dates go. 1066 is the famous um, um, time when William the Conqueror took over England, and he was a Norman from France, and that area of Normandy in France was actually a Viking settlement. Um, the, the famous Viking Rollo was the one who founded Normandy. If you guys are at all fans of the, uh, I was going to say HBO show, it's not HBO, it's the History Channel. How many of you watch Vikings on the History Channel? Um, <clears throat> very, very well done series if you're at all interested in that kind of stuff. It's obviously drawing from um, legendary material, Viking sagas, some history, and it's kind of mixing up the chronology a little bit, but um, they do give you a little bit of an insight as to the culture and um, certain figures that are kind of important. So uh, the last thing which you can't see because I've got that little... Um, Humanities logos, the uh, Rus, all right, the Kievan Rus, um, the Varangians that move into what is now Russia. That's kind of the origins of Russia. So Vikings are going to have a really big impact. Um, where they have the least impact, incidentally, happens to be in North America, where they have a, a very brief settlement before it basically dwindles and disappears. But again, this is what 500, almost 500 years prior to the arrival of Columbus. So. Um, Anyways, that's kind of your brief chronology. I'm not going to test you guys on dates, but let's move on and talk about the story. Let's start with myth. Like I said, around 1,000, you start to see uh, Christianization of the Norse become more widespread. And this, like I said, is a slow process. You've got certain groups convert earlier and some groups convert later. So I'm just giving you a ballpark figure. And when it comes to the writing of the mythology, right, the, the, the old tradition being put down into a written form, it was actually at the hand of Christian Norsemen. And one of the sources of the Norse myth that is going to be compiled into writing was is an earlier oral tradition that we're going to call the Elder Edda, the Poetic Edda. When I say it's composed between like 800 and 1100, I'm talking about it's composed orally. It's passed down by word of mouth. There's a, a series of songs and um, well, poems that are retelling both the stories of the gods and the stories of their heroes. Now that material is first put into writing in the 13th century. You have uh, Snorri Sturluson who comes along and composes what's called the Younger Edda or the Prose Edda. Sometimes it's just referred to as Snorra Edda name from him, and we'll put it around 1220. This is a prose version of the earlier poetry, okay? So he's taking these stories and putting it into a new format, and there's very much a Christian background to this. Snorra, Snorri was a Christian writer from Iceland, and it's kind of interesting, and I may bring this up again when we do the Volsunga saga, but in the in his Edda, you have a creation story given, right? This, this, this portion of the story called the Deluding of Gilfi is essentially the creation story from Norse mythology. And it's set up as a dialogue between this guy Gilfi and these gods who go by these false names, um, High One, Justice High, and Third. They don't really tell you who these guys are, but it's a dialogue talking, it's kind of a question and answer exchange, you know? This, this king, this human king, Gilfi, uh, is asking them questions about where the world came from, you know, where human life came from, where the gods came from, who the gods are. It's all these questions that really summarize a lot of the great stories in Norse Nor Nor mythology. But Gilfi is a Christian king. And prior to getting to this section of his story, the, the Gilfaginning, the deluding of Gilfi, he gives you kind of an introduction to his work. And it actually goes back to the creation we find in the book of Genesis. Because as a Christian, he's tying it into kind of the biblical tradition. And then he gives a, a, an explanation for the origin of a lot of the Norse gods. As a matter of fact, he connects the Norse gods all the way back to the city of Troy. Now, I think I'm going to hold off on going through that material because, like I said, I'll probably touch on that when we do the Norse story of the Volsunga saga. But the point that I'm getting at here is there's, there's very much a Christian emphasis there is a tie-in to earlier Greco-Roman culture, and then he's going to try to give you a version of the Norse tradition, almost from a Christian perspective. And it's a contest, that deluding of Gilfi, where Gilfi is asking these questions of the Norse gods, 
and this is the way it's often interpreted, is like a, a contest of worldview. And there's a winner and there's a loser, right? So the way it would work is a person would ask a question, the other side would answer the question. And it would go back and forth, question and answer, question and answer, until one of the sides either runs out of their questions, has no more questions that they can ask, or the other side has no more answers for the questions. And whoever you know asks the last question or gives the last answer is basically the winner of the contest. And in the story, at the end of this dialogue, ultimately the gods disappear. And a lot of people interpret that as kind of this replacement. Christianity has now taken over and replaced the old pagan worldview. So understand that a lot of the material we get about Norse mythology comes from this period, okay? And it's not that it was a living tradition so much anymore, though, like I said, some people still adhere to the old beliefs. Anyways, that's the prose edda. And in his prose edda, in the deluding of Gilfi, you're going to get the story of Balder. So your textbook draws primarily from this as a source. There's other stuff written down a little bit later, same century, let's say between 1250, maybe 1270. You've got the Elder Edda put into a written form. So the old poems that had been oral tradition were finally put down into some kind of written form. And this is just like a collection of these things in two sections. You've got the mythical material, basically the stories of the gods. And then you've got the heroic poems, which have to do with a lot of the early sagas. Okay, so... There'll be scattering references to a lot of these stories there, but you're not going to get maybe as complete a version as you might find in the prose edda. So, anyways, let's move on and talk a little bit about Balder, who is the star of the show today. Or, briefly, the star of the show, because he doesn't stick around for very long. Obviously, the story is called The Death of Balder for a reason. So, even if you didn't read it, spoiler alert, right? Um, so, who is Balder? If you are not familiar with the god, he is... The most famous or favored of the gods is a better way to put it. He's a god associated with daytime. So he might be referred to as the shining one or the prince, the beloved. Clearly in your textbook, he's called the most loved of all the gods. He's beautiful. He's handsome. Um, charismatic, probably. Now, as the story opens, we're introduced to a dream, right? Balder, and, and let me know if you guys have read the story. Um, I'm not going to not tell it just because you may not have read it. I don't care if I ruin it for you. You do need to go back and read it. But um, you know, in the chat, let me know if you remember these things. And I'll kind of pose a few questions. There's, there's a dream that he has. Okay, cool. Some people are, are following me. Now, dreams are never just dreams. Okay? In other words, dreams are not meaningless. Especially in the world of myth, dreams always have some significance. And when I call them oracular, I'm referring to the idea that they are predictive of the future. They're, they're foreboding. They're going to um, be in the realm of prophecy. And it's not wrong to say dreams are never just dreams, even from a modern perspective, right? We talked already about kind of the influence of the, the psychoanalysis, uh, psychoanalysts like Freud and Jung in uh, myth interpretation. So, you know, from their perspective, also dreams are not just dreams. There's something really important and uh, going on in the dream world. And I think that's pretty much what people believe today about dreams. It's not just, you know, random stuff going on. Your, your mind is doing something as you sleep. But in this dream, who remembers what happened in the dream or what the dream was about? Because it's not a good dream. It's kind of a nightmare, right? His death. All right. He dreams. He sees of hell. Go ahead. He sees hell. Okay. I didn't I catch exactly what you said, but yeah, he sees hell. This, this idea that he's going to die, which is exactly what it means. It's prophesying his death. And this is really bothersome to his family. I mean, obviously he's loved by everybody, but his parents, um, particularly his mother, have a, a, a especially close attachment, which is normal, right? So let's introduce those two characters. So in the Pantheon, Odin is probably the most important of all the gods in Norse mythology. He's the All-Father. He is the god of prophecy. He is a god of war. He's a god of poetry. He plays a number of different roles. And he really, having this idea of prophecy, I know we didn't talk about the rest of the origin story, but Odin gave up an eye to drink from the well of Mimir, which gives him this future vision. Okay, so Odin is always the god with the one eye. 
That's his most important characteristic when you're given a a description in certain stories of the one-eyed man. You know who we're talking about. They don't always name him. It's expected that you you know who who this is. So Odin knows the future, and he is in a constant, uh, what's it called? I don't want to call it a panic, but he's in a, he's got this mission to prepare for this particular event that is coming down the road. And that event is actually tied in with the death of Baldur. To who knows what that event is? What he's good, Ragnarok, right? He knows about Ragnarok, which is really the end of everything, or definitely the end of the gods. It's often translated as the twilight of the gods or the doom of the gods. So when he hears about the dream of Baldur, it's not only the loss of his son that he's thinking of, he's also thinking about this Ragnarok that is about to come, okay? And what he does, by the way, to prepare for that is he gathers together the fallen warriors, the the heroic warriors, and brings them through the use of his Valkyries. These Valkyries are kind of his servants who escort the valiant dead up to Valhalla, which is kind of like the Norse version of heaven. And it's this giant mead hall. So this is kind of the center of the community. It's where the you know the Viking culture would, would gather together, right? They eat, they drink, they socialize. And the supreme mead hall is, of course, the heavenly Valhalla. And the heroes party until the time when the horn is blown and Ragnarok breaks out. And then they all rush back out and fight alongside the gods. And they're going to lose. Okay, I don't want to get ahead of the story. But um, Odin knows all this, right? So he doesn't, you know, this is a bad sign, this dream. On the other hand, you've got Frigg. Now, Frigg is the wife of Odin. She is a goddess who also has attachment to prophecy. She knows the future, but in this particular story, they don't emphasize her knowledge of the future so much as her characteristics as a mother, right? She loves her son, and she doesn't want her son to die. So like any good mother, she's going to try to protect her child. Now, the self-fulfilling prophecy is what happens uh, how many have heard the term self-fulfilling prophecy? You know what that might refer to? Okay, a couple people have heard of it. Good. It's the idea that the prophecy is brought about by your own action, sometimes in an attempt to avoid the prophecy. And in this story, she actually brings it about in trying to prevent it, or his death. She's going to bring about his death by, by trying to prevent his death. So let's look at how she attempts to do this. Oop, I should back up just a little bit and not get ahead of, I don't, I don't have a lot of details in these slides. So um, yeah, Oedipus Rex, very good as an example. We talked about that in our introductory lecture. So good, that's, that's one of the classic examples of the self-fulfilling prophecy, Oedipus. This one, she is gonna to attempt to get everything to swear an oath not to harm her son. Right, she's gonna ask all of the things in nature and all all the things that could potentially harm him to swear an oath not to harm Balder, and everything is happy to do this. As a matter of fact, everything she asks does swear the oath not to harm Balder, and as a side effect, he becomes invulnerable. Okay, not that anything has done has, has changed about him, but the change is due to these things that are no longer gonna harm him. Now, this is where I should go to the slide that talks about. The Superman motif. Maybe I should say it's the other way around that you know Superman is kind of based on the Balder motif. But this is the idea of the invulnerable hero. This is a, a standard motif you find in hero stories, and we're going to see it all through the semester. The character that is impervious to damage. And a lot of times it's easy to confuse invulnerability with other things. So when I ask students usually, what does it mean to be invulnerable? A lot of them say uh, you can't be defeated. Or, or you can't die. And literally, it's, it, it's actually not that. Um, you could be defeated. That would be being invincible, not being able to be defeated. And immortal would be not being able to die. And one thing that's interesting about the Norse gods, if you weren't already familiar with this, is that the Norse gods are mortal beings. They, they die like human beings do. They're just kind of bigger and more powerful beings. But invulnerable literally means in, unable to be wounded. Okay, so the idea here is, Baldur is impervious to harm, and for a story to be interesting, when you have a character at the center of the story that's invulnerable, you need to have what? You need to have what to get the story 
moving along. Can they really be fully invulnerable? Yes, you have to have a weakness, very good, which is why I have the Superman analogy up here. If you're more, I mean, people are generally fairly familiar with Superman. He's one of the most easily recognizable characters in pop culture. And I think everybody also knows that he has a weakness to kryptonite. So Superman would be incredibly dull if he didn't have the weakness to kryptonite. Uh, and believe it or not, the, uh, <clears throat> the introduction of kryptonite into the comic books for Superman was not due to trying to correct him being you know, too powerful. I don't know if anybody knows the history of Superman, but I believe, if I'm recalling correctly, it was introduced back when they had the old radio program, Superman radio program back in the 40s. And I believe the actor that was doing the voice of Superman was sick for a while. So they introduced kryptonite into the, the show to explain his absence from the, from the serial. But of course, it becomes one of the most famous elements in the story. It's a weakness. And Balder, too, has an inherent weakness. What is it? Who remembers? The one thing that can harm Balder. It's a <clears> small <throat> tree. Yeah. Yeah, they kind of describe it in your text as a small plant or tree, a thorny bush. Um, it's called mistletoe. Now, uh, the whole idea of the weakness, by the way, could be a metaphor for overconfidence, right? When you think you are unable to be defeated or wounded or anything like that, when you think you're just beyond being touched, it's often the moment when you get careless, right? It's the moment when you uh, are too confident and you overlook the one thing that can harm you or bring you down. So this is, in a way, I mean, all these myths have these little life lessons built in. So there's this kind of lesson never to become overconfident and, and not realize your weaknesses because then you're going to fall victim, right, to your weakness. So in this story, it's the mistletoe. Now, the mistletoe is overlooked by Frigg, exactly overlooked. Um, you could assume it would have sworn the oath if she even asked it to, but she saw this thing as too small, too young, too weak, and harmless. And that was the problem, right? It's insignificant. You overlook it. And what you think of as insignificant and harmless ends up being the exact opposite. Okay, so what happens in the story? Well, what are the gods doing once Balder gets this invulnerability? How do they test it? What are they doing to kind of have fun? Right, they're throwing things at him. So they're in the meat hall of the gods, and they're joking around. They're playing around. They're throwing, you can imagine, it's like Viking games, or they're throwing axes at the guy, or bow and, you know, shooting arrows at him, or whatever you want to imagine that they're throwing. But everything's bouncing off of him like bullets off a of Superman. And there's a couple of characters in the hall that are not having fun. One of them is Loki. So here we finally get introduced to our, 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 our villain, our trickster hero. Now, he's bothered by this because, you know, Loki, like many tricksters, kind of motivated by jealousy. He sees all the attention being given to Balder, and Balder's, of course, much more loved than Loki ever was. So he's sitting there jealous, and he wants to figure out, you know, what's going on? Is this really um, the case that he's invulnerable? Is there no weakness out there at all? So he's going to decide, he's going to go out and try to figure out where there might be a weakness. And Loki is a shapeshifter. This is also fairly common of the trickster. You can change form. You can change the way you appear. And he takes on the guise of an old woman and goes to Frigg, the mother, to find out what the deal is. Now, the guise of an old woman, this is one of the classic examples of the disguise. Um, I think, now we didn't really do... There's other stories that I usually cover, like uh, the story of Persephone. Demeter takes on the guise of an old woman in that story. Um, Hera is going to do this also when we get to some stories later this semester. So kind of keep that in mind, this idea of the old woman that shows up very often is not just an old woman. It's often you know somebody else in disguise. So it's Loki in this case, and it's a good disguise. Why? I mean, why is the old woman like maybe the perfect disguise? Trustworthy, yes, yeah, seems harmless, right? It goes right along with this whole theme of the mistletoe. It looks harmless, you know, it's kind of innocent and, and frail and not threatening. So Frigg goes ahead and opens right up and, you know, spills the beans. She basically says, you know, yeah, everything's for this oath. And then he presses it and says, well, are you sure you got everything? Is there anything you may have overlooked? And Frigg says, well, there was this one little plant and, you know, it's, it's harmless, so don't worry about it. But, of course, that's all Loki needs, right? He's got... 
the the one piece of kryptonite that can kill Balder. And he goes off and he gets himself some mistletoe and he sharpens it into a pointy stick. And then he goes back to the hall and... <laughs> Hold on one second. Okay. Sorry about that. The... Um, the mistletoe, he goes back into the hall, and he doesn't use it himself, which is really the, the worst part of his character here. He's going to use somebody else, somebody else that is not enjoying anything either, but not because he's jealous. His right, his blind brother, uh, Hodor. Um, I'll get to him in a second. Um, but he's going to use that. And, and again, the blindness of Hodor is kind of interesting uh, because it's not just a physical blindness when it comes down to it. There's this idea of being unaware, right? I mean, blind is a metaphor. You could think of it in, in several different ways. There's the physical side and there's the non-physical side. So um, he's easily duped. He's, he's tricked by the trickster. And uh, it makes it even sadder. And if you didn't know this, Hodor is not just the brother of Baldur. He's the um, twin brother of Baldur. So where Baldur often represents daytime, Hodor, appropriately, represents nighttime, right, in the darkness. Because literally, I mean, he's in the dark, unfortunately. Loki plays on that. So let's talk about the pros and cons of mistletoe. Because here's a really wonderful symbol that kind of sums up this idea of vulnerability and doom. You've got the idea that it's innocent and harmless on one hand, and the idea that it is the most harmful thing on the other. Now, Okay, uh, on the screen you might not be able to see the last two boxes. I don't know why that is. Um, I'll describe what's in there if you can't actually see what's on the screen. You'll be able to see it on the video later. But there is a great deal of pagan significance uh, attributed and attached to mistletoe. It's a plant, and it was used in pagan rituals from the Greco-Roman world into the Celtic and Norse world and it had different things that it symbolized. So for instance, among the Celts, mistletoe was viewed as a plant that could have healing potential. Okay, it was referred to sometimes as all heal. Um, it was a symbol of fortune. It was a symbol of protection, um, a protection from evil. It could drive away evil spirits. It was a sign of peace, also a symbol of fertility that was even viewed as potentially an aphrodisiac. Okay, so that might be some of the stuff that's cut off at the bottom of your screen right now. Among the Norse, it had similar you know, attributions or connections to love and protection. And it was also sacred to the goddess Frigga and Frey. Freya, we haven't really introduced yet, but she's a goddess of fertility who comes from a portion of the gods known as the Vanir. I didn't really introduce you guys to the Aesir and the Vanir distinction among the gods, but uh, maybe I'll do that on another lecture. So you can understand why, from Frigga's point of view, mistletoe is harmless, why it could potentially be a, a good thing. But does anybody know anything about real mistletoe? Maybe some negative characteristics of mistletoe? Yes, very good. It is It's actually poisonous. Um, so what apparently seems to be harmless is, in reality, toxic. Okay? It's also a parasite. Mistletoe grows on trees. That's because it's, you know, basically sucking the life from a host. Now, it's not necessarily going to kill the tree, but um, parasites are those types of characters that um, suck life from a host. And the most famous of the mythological parasites would be something like the vampire, right? It sucks blood from a host. You know, and the really skilled vampires will keep their host alive long enough to continue to feed. They don't always, you know, do them in. So it's, it's a great sign. It's, it's kind of like the story we did last time with Prometheus <clears throat> and the two bags, right? Uh, kind of what looks good on the outside, inside is not good. So what looks harmless on the outside in reality ends up being deadly. Now, it's probably good for you guys to be able to identify mistletoe. So I always ask my students, what does mistletoe look like? And almost invariably, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to get the same basic description come back. So let me see who can describe mistletoe. What do you think it looks like? Because it's actually the berries that are poisonous. By the way, talking about using it for healing, um, it's, it's interesting to wonder how exactly they, they did use it. I don't know very much about how it was used medicinally, but um, possibly to incite vomiting. Okay, 
green leaves, red berries, that's almost every um, one responds that way. And that's actually not correct. Mistletoe does not have red berries. Very good. They have white berries. Now, where does this confusion come in? Well, what you're thinking of when you think of the red berries is holly. So let me give you a little bit of a background. I already talked about the, myth, the um, mistletoe being associated with pagan ritual, uh, decoration and pagan, pagan festivals, pagan altars, stuff like that from the Greco-Roman world on. you got to now think about what happens in Europe, kind of the late Roman Empire and following. You've got the introduction of Christianity, which starts to replace pagan tradition and really pushes out a lot of pagan ritual where it doesn't adopt and adapt pagan ritual, which also happens. So... Where you usually think of mistletoe today is in context of Christian celebration of Christmas, which is the, you know, the birth of Christ. Now, in the older church, there was this idea that the, the mistletoe, which was identified and connected with paganism, there was actually the idea of kind of banning the use of mistletoe in decorations for Christian ceremonies and Christian celebration. And what the Christian church actually did is they would substitute, the idea was to substitute a new plant for the mistletoe, and they introduced holly. And the reason they chose holly as a replacement was because of the shape of the leaves and the redness of the berries, which have symbolic reference to Jesus. And I don't know if anybody can think of what those might be. Anybody know what the, the, the thorny um, leaves are supposed to remind you of or what the red berries are supposed to remind you of? In Christian tradition. Okay, good. I see. That. Yeah, crown of thorns and the blood of Christ. Okay, so that was the idea of using the holly. But of course, what you normally happens is people don't generally just abandon their old ways, their old traditions, and stuff like that. So where holly is introduced, mistletoe doesn't disappear. People continue to use mistletoe, and of course, today, like you said in the text, there, um, there's a tradition now of kissing below the mistletoe. And supposedly this comes from the older tradition. I don't know how often this was actually practiced, but like I said, it was a sign of peace for the Celts um, and the Norse. And the idea was if you come underneath a tree where mistletoe is growing, um, probably a Druidic custom because the Druids had a lot of rituals that involved mistletoe. But supposedly if two warriors met below mistletoe, they were supposed to lay down their weapons and not fight. Um, But of course you also have this connection to fertility. So this idea of peace when you're underneath the mistletoe and it being a symbol of fertility uh, fits really well with this new tradition of kissing beneath the mistletoe. So it's kind of a, um, a mixture of coming some of this paganism with the Christian um, Christmas celebration. So uh, anyways, that's the weakness of Balder, the mistletoe. So going back to Hodor, Hodor throws this little pointy stick that Loki gives him. And of course, he's blind. He doesn't know where to throw. So Loki goes ahead and just guides his hand to make it even worse. And as soon as the thing hits him, it pierces his heart and he drops dead to the ground immediately. And of course, everybody is now distressed, with the exception of Loki. Now, is all hope lost? Not necessarily. The gods hope that even though he's in, he's in hell, and I really didn't even introduce hell, but I know most of you are familiar with the word, again, probably because of the Christian tradition of naming the underworld hell. This comes from the Norse goddess, or rather giantess, who's a daughter of Loki. Um, It's god Hel, H-E-L, with one L, who rules a realm known as Niflheim. Niflheim is this cold realm that represents the afterlife. This is where most of the dead go to. Those that aren't taken to Valhalla end up in the realm of hell. Now, Baldur goes to hell, and there is a hope that somebody can go down after him and negotiate his return. Now, n- nobody really wants to journey into this realm. This is a, it's a terrible place to go. But there is one hero, rather I should say god hero, because you know these are still gods we're talking about, not mortal heroes. But who's the brother who is brave enough to take the journey to the underworld? to the realm of the dead. Anybody remember his name? Her- okay, close. It's Hermod. Hermod. 
Very good. Hermod is going to be the one who rides down to hell. Now, this motif is really, really important for hero stories. As a matter of fact, in this story, we've already been introduced to the invulnerable hero. Um, we're going to be introduced to a number of other things that are standard um, pictures in hero stories. This first one is the descent into the underworld. Like when we do our introduction to hero stories, we're going to really beat this one to death especially as we look at the hero stories for the rest of the semester too. But the descent into the underworld is usually this idea of crossing a boundary into another realm, the realm of the dead. Sometimes it's not literally the underworld. It could be done in a few different ways, but this one literally is. And it usually is a long journey into darkness. And it usually does take you down, down, down into some kind of um, literal descent. So Hermod is going to go... And to go on his journey, he actually gets Odin's horse. So Odin has this fantastic steed known as Sleipnir. It's eight-legged horse. And Hermod decides he's going to volunteer to go down and negotiate with Hel for the return of Baldur. Now, he successfully gets to Hel, jumps over the gates into the realm of Niflheim, and approaches Hel herself and negotiates the return. Now, there's a deal that's struck. What is the condition under which she will allow Baldur to return to the upper world. Anybody remember what has to be done for this to work out? Yeah, everything must weep for the dead, Baldur. And he thinks, yeah, I'll take the deal. I'll go back and see if everybody will weep. But what you're now into is another motif that we call the impossible task. Now, the impossible task many times when I use that phrase, I'm going to refer to something that it might not literally be impossible, I call it the impossible task because it is something that is supposed to be impossible. The hero is supposed to fail in the task. And most of the time, it's even meant to maybe even get rid of the hero permanently. Not only are they going to be sent away on a journey and um, fail, but maybe they'll die along the way. Now, generally, the hero is going to succeed in the impossible task and avoid death. But in this interesting story, he doesn't, right? It actually turns out to literally be impossible. But why? I mean, she strikes the bargain for an obvious reason. She doesn't want to give up Balder. And she has an idea that is going to be impossible because she knows exactly why he's going to fail. So who remembers why he ultimately fails in getting everybody to, to weep? Because he's off to a pretty good, yeah, exactly, Loki. And yet that's her dad. She knows her dad. She knows Loki is not going to weep for, for Balder. So it's kind of a setup. You know, I'll, I'll give him back if you get this to happen. You know, I know it's never going to happen, so it's over. But Hermod's not as uh, aware. I mean, he's naive in a certain sense because he goes out and tries to get everybody to, think, everybody to cry. And so far, so good until he arrives exactly at a giantess. Now, the giantess happens to be Loki in disguise. And, of course, the giantess forget the name that he goes by, Throck or something like that, but um, which is maybe a typical giantess name. Uh, she says she's not going to weep, and that's it. One refusal, end of mission. And, uh, of course, he fails, so literally impossible. So Balder is doomed to stay there, but as you'll see by the end of the story, he's not going to stay there forever. The attention in the story then turns towards Loki, right? The gods want retribution. They want Loki punished. I mean, he's had his tricks in the past. He's done different things that have been kind of unacceptable. But, you know, even the trickster can go a little too far on occasion. And this is the occasion where he now needs to be dealt with. So let's talk about the torment of the trickster and the capture of Loki. And I think this is where I want to go. I want to make sure I'm not leaving anything out. It's a lot of times when I'm telling these stories, I forget key pieces, but sometimes I'll go back and touch on them later if I, if I do remember. If you remember the story, Loki flees up to the mountains in the beginning. And he's sitting in this little hut at the top of the mountain. He's got the doors open on all sides, kind of like four doors to the four directions. And he's rocking in a little rocking chair and he's weaving. Anybody catch what he's weaving as he's sitting there worried about the gods catching up to him and tracking him down? Yes. A net. Now, Loki is often associated with fishing. Fishing was a, a very big occupation among the Norse. And, you know, as he's weaving the net, you can imagine how the paranoia sets in, right? Because a net is there to catch something. 
and he knows it's only a matter of time before the gods catch him. And in his panic, he kind of throws the net over into the fire and then decides he's going to run out of the hut and hide elsewhere. And he goes down and takes the form of what? He shapeshifts again and hides in a stream, right? A little river. A salmon, right? Takes the shape of an animal, a fish. Now, the gods eventually arrive at the hut. And it's kind of like, you know, CSI Iceland. They dust the place and they check for fingerprints. And, you know, they find this little scrap of a net which quite hasn't quite burned up in the fireplace. And immediately the gods realize, ah, he must have taken the form of a salmon and he's hiding down in the stream. Because, you know, obviously. And off they go. And they are going to now catch up to him. And who is the hero at this point is finally we're introduced to Thor, right? Thor has not played a big role in this story. Actually, doesn't play a very big role in the story, even though he is one of the most famous characters in Norse mythology. So let's talk just a little bit about Thor. I'll probably bring him up more when we actually talk about the movie Thor. But he's the god of thunder, right? He is the strongest of the gods. A little bit different from the way he's usually depicted. I've got the, you know, obviously, Marvel version of Thor right here. You know, blonde-haired, um, good-looking character. The, the Norse version of Thor is generally this red-bearded, red-haired guy. He has to wear this belt, which increases his strength. He wears these gauntlets, kind of like Thanos, uh, that allow him to pick up his hammer, which is his most famous object, the short um, hammer Mjolnir. <clears throat> so all of that's from the story or from the mythology. Uh, you could also talk about his, his chariot. He's actually pulled in a chariot drawn by goats. And, <clears throat> you know, one of the goats had been, is, was wounded. I forgot somebody had eaten part of the goat and uh, a little bit crippled. And the reason that the goats are kind of crippled and, and, and limp as they pull his chariot is to explain the phenomenon of lightning because it's his chariot going through the sky that is the path of the lightning. So he's a god of thunder and lightning. And the noise is his chariot having all these little devices hanging off of it. So it clanks and it, and it limps along, uh, you know, explaining the jagged uh, look of the thunderbolt, okay, or the lightning bolt. Anyways, in the story, he grabs a hold of Loki as Loki tries to escape, and he just digs his nails into the salmon as Loki is trying to wiggle away out of his grip. Now, this is a motif that's kind of fun to talk about as well. It's the motif of the strong man versus the shapeshifter. It is perhaps a metaphor for endurance. And you find other examples of this in mythology, one of which I'm going to share with you right now. So obviously, Loki's a trickster shapeshifter. Thor, the strong man. Um, a story that we will probably touch on later has to do uh, with Greek mythology. There is a story that I like to use as a parallel where you have the goddess Thetis. And I don't remember if I introduced her. I did. Okay, remember back to Prometheus, our last session. I talked about the goddess who Zeus needed to avoid sleeping with. And I said it was this character, Thetis, because she was destined to give birth to a child more powerful than the father. How many of you remember that? Now, Prometheus knows who it is. And right, Zeus eventually finds out and doesn't sleep with Thetis. And I said that Thetis ends up having to marry a mortal human being by the name of Peleus, who was one of the Argonauts. So in the story of his engagement <laughs> to Thetis, he is told to go into this cave. Remember, she's a goddess, he's a human, and she's a sea nymph. So she's down by the sea. He goes into this cave where she lives, and what he needs to do is grab a hold of her and basically hang on until she submits to marrying him and agrees to marry him. Um, not the best picture of an engagement, but she resists. And in the story, being a goddess, she has the ability to change shape, and she changes into a lion, and she changes into a sea serpent, and she changes into all these monsters as she tries to break free of his grip. But he's a powerful hero, and he holds on and holds on and holds on until she just stops fighting. Same thing Loki does. He stops fighting. And then, of course, she marries him, okay? And then you're going to get Achilles and the Trojan War and all the stuff that follows from that. So we will we'll visit this story again later. But as a matter of fact, we're going to talk about their wedding down the road when we get to Troy. But for now, I want to just talk about this motif because it's kind of interesting as a metaphor for endurance in 
maybe a life lesson, because every once in a while I'll try to bring out a life lesson from these stories, because that's what they were, right, to the cultures. And the idea, I like to think of it in the context of trying to learn something new. Um, we talked about the shapeshifter, not the shapeshifter, but the trickster, as somebody who introduces chaos, right, to the order that's established. So Loki is definitely a figure of chaos. And we said chaos is the thing you can't ever understand. It's just beyond comprehension because it doesn't have form or shape or structure. And the trickster as a shapeshifter is a chaotic figure. So when it comes to learning something, knowing something, coming to understand, our minds cannot grasp that which doesn't have form. So the motif here, if you're thinking about learning something new, maybe it's a subject you're studying that is incredibly difficult. Uh, I always use the example of math. Some people are just really naturally skilled in math. It comes very easy for them. Other people struggle with math. You could be taught the stuff over and over and over again, and you may grasp it for a little while, and then you forget it, and you, you just can't figure out the problem, and it seems to get so frustrating you're willing to quit and just give up and throw away you know, the homework problems in the textbook or whatever. I know they don't usually use textbooks anymore, but yeah, okay, I understand the, 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 the feeling I suck at math. Good. So the idea or the lesson built in is one where even though it's frustrating, even though you can't grab a hold of it securely, even though it doesn't take shape in your mind and seems to be about to slip away, the idea is you need to be like the strong hero. You need to be like the one who grasps on and holds on until you force it into some kind of shape, until you force it to make sense. Um, the idea of not quitting, right? So no matter how bad you are at math, if you stick with it long enough, eventually, and I'm not saying it's easy, eventually it's going to start to make a little bit more sense. And then eventually, you know, we talk about grasping an idea. That's literally what's going on here. You're grasping a hold of something. So the lesson from the story of Thor and Loki or from Thetis and Peleus um, is don't quit. You hold on until that thing takes shape. Um, for me, my personal experience, you know, I ended up doing a, a graduate degree in philosophy. And when I was an undergraduate, you know, taking philosophy classes, it was really, really difficult. You know, talk about trying to figure out how to think in a different way. Go take an introductory class in philosophy where you've had no background in philosophy. And you're going to be frustrated, at least I was, for most of the semester. But my own experience was... You know, and literally, I, I literally threw my textbooks after reading paragraphs seven, eight times, not knowing what the heck I was reading. It didn't make any sense to me. Tossing the book, getting away from it, thinking about quitting the course, dropping the course, but then coming back later, slowing down, trying it again, maybe when I was fresh, arrested, and eventually ah, you know, it starts to make sense. You start to get a little bit of a picture and then it fleshes itself out. So it's this idea that you just don't quit. You know, it's always darkest before the dawn type of a thing. It's usually, you know, right before you would have gotten it is when people drop out of the race. So anyways, great life lesson. Loki's captured. It's time to put him to... Um, not the test, but to, uh, to to justice. You know, you've got to subject him to what doesn't seem really like a very just punishment. This is fairly extreme. Who does this remind you of? This torment that Prometheus. I'm sorry, <laughs> I got it up on the screen, don't I? I was going to say Prometheus. Loki is another version of Prometheus. So since I already ruined that, I'm not going to ask you guys to give me the feedback. But the torment is almost the exact same thing. It's actually worse with Loki than it is with Prometheus because he he watches one of his sons literally devoured by another of his sons um, that has turned into a wolf, lip, torn limb from limb. And then with his own son's intestines, Loki is bound to a rock under the earth. And above him is suspended a serpent that, that drips venom onto him. And when the venom pours on him, you know, it's agonizing. It's, it's like acid. And it just causes him to scream and writhe in pain. And the only piece of, I guess, what is it called? Um mercy that's shown him is extended him by his wife. So his wife, Sagin, holds this bowl over Loki to catch the venom. 
problem with bowls, of course, is they only hold so much liquid. So every once in a while, she's got to turn around and dump the venom. And when she moves the bowl, it hits him in the face and he screams. And what does this supposed to, or what is this supposed to explain? What natural phenomenon is this supposed to explain? His screaming and writhing under the earth. I know we talked about nature myths and stuff. It's an explanation for the earthquake. All right, this is what causes earthquakes. That's Loki still trapped down there below us. Because this is the present state. Okay? Part of the prophecy that Odin knows about the end of the world is that eventually Loki will be released. But right now, that's still future. Okay? The death of Baldur, like I said, is a sign of the coming of Ragnarok, but it's just the first domino in a whole chain, which we're going to get to in a second. Um, when I said, you know, Loki's a more modern Prometheus, I was kind of playing on the idea of the modern Prometheus. Anybody know where that, that phrase comes from, the modern Prometheus? Very famous novel by Mary Shelley that uses that. As a matter of fact, I, I used to use that story in my mythology class. I used to have the students read that um, when we did creation myths. Anybody know who the modern Prometheus is? Mary Shelley's... I know some of you have heard of it. Maybe you've even seen a movie based on it. Anybody familiar with Frankenstein? <clears throat> Frankenstein, the, sub, the subtitle of Frankenstein was Modern Prometheus. So, anyways, uh, let's move on, I think, to Ragnarok. So, the doom of the gods. All right. Eventually, Ragnarok will arrive. And it begins with the release of Loki. He's going to break free of his bonds. And, and probably should have gone back a second and talked about whether you thought this was a just punishment. Like I said, it's extreme, right? His child is killed in front of him, and then he's bound with the child's intestines. It's like a gruesome, ever-present reminder. It's not just a physical torture, right? We're talking mental and emotional anguish. Is that fair? Is it just? Or is this too intense. What do you guys think? And if it is just, why might it be viewed as proper justice? Because we think of justice, by the way, as, as a balance very often. You think it's too intense? Okay. Anybody think it's just right? And when you think it's too intense, it's usually because you think of the fact that somebody else had to die for Loki's crime, right? His own son. Anybody want to go with it's proportional? It's fair? Nobody? Well, I think one of the reasons you might be able to make the case that it's an appropriate punishment, eye for an eye, yeah. He took Odin's son, and then Odin's going to take his son. Yeah, I think that's kind of the idea there. Um, and he's going to remember it. You know, he's bound to those intestines. It's not something he's going to forget. Not that you would forget the death of a child anyways, but again... Um, this is justice, and it's harsh. It's Viking justice. So Ragnarok, um, he's released, you know, he actually breaks free, and then you have the sides drawn. The doors of Valhalla burst open. The Aesir, which are the, the gods that Odin rules, rush out to battle with the Einherjar, which are the, the fallen dead. These are the heroes that have been spending their time in Valhalla and partying until this moment when fate arrives. Now, here's the, the thing that is maybe frustrating. Odin knows about Ragnarok, he's known about it since he could see the future, and he'd been preparing it, preparing for it the whole time. But when the lines are drawn, what happens to Odin? Does anybody know? Because I don't remember if your textbook actually goes into Ragnarok at the end of this story or just kind of mentions it. I know there's also you know, other places in the textbook that do talk about Ragnarok, but the two sides face off, the gods versus the frost giants and various monsters and and Loki. And Odin fights a very famous character known as Fenrir. If you've seen the, uh, the movie Thor Ragnarok, by the way, Fenrir makes an appearance. He's the great wolf. Okay, you can see that actually in the visual here. Now the wolf, who is a son of Odin, I'm sorry, a son of Loki, fights Odin. And what happens to Odin? Do we know in the battle? Does he kill Fenrir? He does not. 
he's killed by Fenrir. Fenrir himself is killed, you know, by some of the sons of Odin. Um, but Odin dies. So again, part of his knowledge of the future is not just that Ragnarok's coming, but it's a knowledge of how the the battle is going to end up, right? He knows he's going to die. He knows, as a matter of fact, all of the gods are going to die in Ragnarok. It is not a victory for the gods. And let me just give you the rest of the lineup. Thor versus Jormungand. Jormungand is the world serpent. This is another son of Loki. Loki is the son, I'm sorry, the father of various... Uh, horrible monsters. I mean, the world serpent is one of the largest dragons that surrounds um, Midgard. Midgard, by the way, is, is Earth. The Aesir live in Asgard, so it would be the home of the gods. And they're connected, by the way, by Bifrost, which is the Rainbow Bridge. So, again, you might know this from Thor movie. Heimdall, who is the guardian of that bridge, faces off against Loki. Um, and then you've got Tyr, who I don't think we've mentioned. He is a god of war. Uh, one of the bravest of the gods. He fights uh, against this this giant dog known as Garm. And then Frey and Surt. Frey is a god of fertility. He's one of the Vanir gods, and he fights against Surt, who is the destroyer, also makes an appearance in Thor Ragnarok. Anyways, in all of these cases, Odin dies, right? And then Fenrir is killed. Thor versus the world serpent. Thor kills the world serpent, but in doing so, the venom kills him. So Thor dies. Heimdall versus Loki. They both die. Tyr versus Garm, they both die. Frey versus Surt, Frey dies. Surt remains kind of the last man standing, if you want to call him a man, but he's the destroyer. He's the one that is going to bring about the destruction of everything at the end of Ragnarok. So here's Odin, who knows the future, preparing for this future in an entirely futile effort to make a difference, and he fails. And he knew he was going to fail. So the question usually is, why does he bother? What's the, is there a lesson here? You know, why do what you know will fail? Anybody got an idea? Is he just being foolish? Should he have spent his time doing something else? Drinking mead, writing poetry? All right, you could say he tried. Right? There's definitely something to be said for effort. Yeah, you got to go out fighting. That's true. Pride, possibly. Yeah. Don't want to just roll over and play dead. Um, it could be, again, one of those moral lessons that you're supposed to get out of the myth. So here's a god, right, that knows the future. And even though he knows he's going to lose. He tries anyways, yet human beings who really don't know the future, I mean, we try to prophesy, we try to foresee what's going to happen down the road, but we don't know what's going to happen. Uh, if Odin is trying, knowing he's going to fail, you know, why wouldn't we try our best not knowing, you know, whether we're going to succeed? I mean, we have got more reason to try because it's possible that we are going to find the success that we're seeking. Um, <laughs> taking as many with him as he can. Yeah, that's that's also a good one. Why why just let the you know the forces of evil overrun uh, existence, right? And by the way, the frost giants who I really haven't even talked about. Loki, by the way, happens to be a, a frost giant who is raised by the gods um, as a son of Odin, but he's not a god himself. I probably should have given you all this in the beginning. It, it's it's my fault. That's that's my bad. But again, you probably knew this from the movies. There's another lesson I think that's also interesting because you got to think of this as really everybody's life. When you really think about what we fight against in a, an entirely futile effort is our own mortality. You know, all of us know that in the end, we're going to die. Yet, we go on and fight against it. At least most people do. I mean, it's a normal thing you do. You eat. You, you take care of yourself. You do whatever you can to push that inevitable conclusion off as long as possible. So this is kind of what Odin is doing, right? We're all going to die, but in the meantime, we're going to do our best to survive, make the best of it, and um, fight to survive, fight, fight to live. Okay, so kind of Odin is, is, is all of us. In this futile struggle, our mortality is going to catch up, whether we like it or not, which is which is kind of neat. Um, 
and hopefully not too depressing. All right, so Sirt is the one that last survives. Um, everything is wiped out by fire. I mean, he's kind of this fiery being. He's from a place known as Muspelheim, by the way, which is this fiery realm. I didn't even talk about the different realms besides Niflheim. Uh, anyways, don't worry about that. And after a cleansing water, right, there's a fire, and then it's eventually a great flood that kind of wipes everything clean in order for there to be a new world born. And there are survivors. So we need to talk about the last thing, which is the return of Balder. Now, Balder eventually comes back. So you could say it's got kind of a happy, as a matter of fact, it is a happy ending. Some of the gods survive. I didn't want to make it sound like everybody was annihilated in the destruction of Surt, but Modi and Magni kind of pick up the, um, the hammer of you know, their father Thor, and they're going to survive and rule the gods. Lif and Lifthrasir are the, um, the human beings that survive. They go up and take refuge in the great uh, ash tree, Yggdrasil. Um, again, the Norse universe is centered around this great ash tree. And then you also have the end of evil. So not only does the world come back, it comes back much better than it ever was before. And Baldur is kind of this symbol of hope and lightness and goodness. Uh, so his return is tied in with that. And we're really have a, kind of this return from the dead motif. We're going to see that a lot in the hero stories, but um, there's this motif in fertility myths that are often called the disappearing god myth. So this story not only is an interesting story as a, kind of a trickster hero myth, but it's also often viewed as kind of in the category of fertility myth. So in very, off, in very many fertility myths, you're going to see a god die or disappear only to return later, um, usually in the future. Um, if it's kind of this prophetic future. We're going to see some other stories where you're going to see this as well, this kind of future return of a hero. But you see this in Aztec mythology with the god Quetzalcoatl, you know, who is, you know, dies and is, or actually doesn't die. He actually leaves Mexico and is supposed to return at the end to bring back a golden age, uh, kind of like a King Arthur. But Baldur is another example of that. Uh, Osiris, who we looked at before, kind of the same type of idea. It's a fertility myth, but it's, also a trickster myth. So anyways, we're going to see plenty of other examples of this, and that's kind of where we're going to wrap up the story of Baldur. So um, Loki, one of the great trickster characters of all time. Um, it's one of the heroes you love to hate. I love Marvel's take on him. Actually, he's a lot more attractive in the Marvel Universe. He really comes across as kind of a a sympathetic character, so we'll we'll take a look at that how they play him in the in the com in the, yeah in the comic books and in the movies. But do you guys have any questions or comments? I'm going to kind of wrap up the lecture here, and then next time we're going to be moving on to hero myth. So really, that's it for trickster heroes.